so um moving on to um so this is the main assignment that we're going to be working on but um like i said i do need to give you a bit of background information um regarding monohybrid and dihybrid crosses so let me go ahead and switch over to another thing cool so a little bit of background vocabulary slash terminology that you're going to want to um pretty much hold on to throughout the whole genetics course is um, I, I gave a little breakdown. So um, starting off with a gene, which is a hereditary determinant of a trait, which is pretty much uh, saying that it's like a fundamental, like um, the ultimate, um, um, what do you call it? Sorry, I'm kind of brain farting here. Um, like a, never mind. So yeah, just go on, uh, go on with this uh, definition here. I just had a little brain fart, sorry. Um, followed by allele. So it's a different form of a gene. So what that means is that if you have this kind of, um, pair here, um, what this is pretty much saying is that um, one each is, um, is pretty much represented as an allele. Um, in this case, you can get it in the form of a dominant allele that is represented in the form of a capital letter. It doesn't necessarily have to be R, um, it could just be any letter, um, just so it's representing a different gene. Um, and followed by a recessive allele, which is denoted as a lowercase letter. And as you can see, it's a lowercase r. And now, whenever you um, come into the terminology that it's going to pre pretty much coming up from here on out is um, like the word homozygous, which essentially means uh, the same two copies of an allele. And then um, right here in this example, this is pretty much what it means by homozygous, where you have the same two copies. You have um, two dominant alleles here, as well as here, um, where you have two um, homozygous recessive alleles because they're denoted in a lowercase letter. And I do have an example here, um, like with a random trait to kind of follow here is for eye color. So um, we would determine, or not determine, but just kind of state that the brown eyed trait is um, a dominant allele um, denoted in the as a capital B. And for blue eyes, it would be denoted as a recessive trait or a recessive allele, I'm sorry, in the um, form of a lowercase b. So if you, oh, I just noticed that these are R's and they're not B's. Oh, let me just change this to R so it follows it. Sorry, I didn't realize that I had different letters here. Oops. There you go. So, um, so yeah, if you have something that is referred to as a homozygous dominant, it, what it's essentially saying is that you have the same two copies of the dominant brown allele. <clears throat> homozygous recessive is that you have the same two copies of the home of the recessive allele for blue eyes. And now um, for heterozygous, that essentially means is that you have two different alleles. You have a capital or a dominant allele for blue eyes, and they're also carrying the recessive alleles for blue eyes. Oh, excuse me. And then um, another thing to kind of, another term that you're gonna wanna know is genotype, which refers to as a genetic makeup of a, an organism, as well as a phenotype, which is a physical expression of a genotype. And um, another way to kind of think of this is whenever they're referring to a phenotype, they're pretty much um, asking you for the physical traits. Like it's kind of, um, so whenever they ask you, what is the phenotype of let's say this character, this pair here, a homozygous dominant, their phenotype would essentially be because they have the dominant trait and they have two copies of the brown allele, um, they would physically um, have a phenotype of brown eyes versus a genotype, which is essentially denoted as these letters here. It's pretty much their genetic makeup. But what we're really gonna be focusing on here is the phenotype, um, moving on with the monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, as well as the chi-square analysis. So for a monohybrid cross, I do have this little um, picture here. Um, you can definitely, hold on. Um, um, cool, sorry. sorry, I'm looking through chats. I didn't realize some of you guys were messaging me. Is it breaking out? Um, are you guys um, able to hear me okay? Sorry to pause it, but I'm getting messages from people. Or is it cutting off? Okay. Are you fine? Okay, cool. And then um, it, this is being recorded and it will be posted to Blackboard um, and everything. So I just wanted to, sorry to pause this. Um, just notice that a lot of people are having little connection issues, but it will be recorded for you guys' convenience and everything. But um, moving on to this monohybrid cross here. Um, so for a monohybrid cross, you're gonna wanna focus on the word mono, which is essentially kind of highlighting that we're kind of assessing for one gene here. 
And in this example, it's assessing for gene color. The gene for um, seed color here is denoted um, in the form of the letter Y. So the um, dominant allele is for yellow. As you can see, the capital um, Y is pretty much determined that it's a yellow <clears throat> um, physical expression. And then um, we have the recessive possibility of having a green outcome. So for a monohybrid cross in Mendel's exper um, experiments with working with like um, seeds and everything and plants and whatnot, um, he started off with pretty much having these two homozygous parents in the P generation. And it's called a P generation for parent generation. <clears throat> and um, here, um, the parent generation only produces one kind of gamete. And remember, gametes are pretty much sex cells, um, like the sperm and egg and everything. And remember that gametes are haploid, so they only carry one copy or one chromosome. Um, so whenever they actually do fuse, that's how you get diploid individuals or the way you are as an individual, you have two copies. So you have 46 chromosomes. So <clears throat> but moving on. Um, so what this is showing here is that we have two homozygous parents um, and they're both homozygous. But if you notice that for yellow, we have two um, capital letters referring to as a pretty much homozygous dominant um, individual crossed with a homozygous recessive individual that denotes that the green seed is pretty much the recessive physical trait here. And then um, just think of these as individuals. So whenever you do cross these guys, you get your F1 generation that produces hybrids. And, um, and what it's meant by hybrids is um, you get hybrids whenever you cross two um, true breeding parents. And what I mean by true breeding is that they produce only offspring that look like themselves whenever they self-pollinate. So if say this guy were to self-pollinate with himself with just yellow and yellow, all that's gonna just keep reoccurring is that yellow physical expression. But yeah, but uh, moving on, uh, we get that F1 hybrid here that we got from the crossing of our true breeding parents. And if you notice that you guys, um, I'm sorry, the outcome is that you get a 100% heterozygosity here. And what I, what I mean by that is um, that you have two different copies of the allele. So now you have the capital Y for a dominant yellow allele as well as a lowercase um, y denoting for the green allele. So the offspring is phenotypically expressing the yellow seed color, but genetically, genotypically, they have the lowercase recessive y allele, meaning that now they have this kind of going through their genes, whatever they're gonna pretty much kind of, now that this is in their genetic makeup, whenever they're allowed to self-pollinate or self-fertilize, um, they produce what is known as, or not what is known, but they refer to as a three to one ratio of yellow to green seeds. <clears throat> and if you notice here, we do have all these three are yellow, but if you notice genotypically, these two are the same where they have the, um, a capital Y and a lowercase y. You know, typically they are yellow. Um, and as well as this two capital Ys that is referred to also as yellow. So if you notice here in our phenotypic ratio, this is our physical expression. So physically, they are gonna be yellow th um, three out of the four opportunities or whenever they're self-pollinate, um, they have a three in four, three in four, three out of four chance of producing yellow physical um, expression. And then they have one out of four chance of producing this um, homozygous recessive <clears throat> physical expression here. And then for this genotype ratio, it's not something to focus on for the assignment, uh, but just so you know, remember this is a genetic makeup. So, um, what it refers to here is that we have one possible outcome of having two capital or homozygous dominant um, for the yellow. And then we have two outcomes here. So we got two um, opportunities, two out of four that are um, heterozygous dominant for the yellow gene. And then we have one opportunity for this homozygous recessive for the um, green gene right here. But yeah. This is essentially like a, a monohybrid. These are, um, this is pretty much like the easiest kind of um, pundit score you can go with because um, we're only assessing for one gene here. But um, that's pretty much it for the monohybrid cross as far as kind of like assessing it. Uh, what we're going to want to focus on, like I said, is this phenotypic ratio um, whenever we move on to the chi-square analysis um, part of the assignment. But um, after going through that, it, was there anything that was like left unclear or am I free to move on? I will take that as move on. Cool. So now dihybrid crosses is where it gets a little trickier here. Um, Cause now in the word um, or in the word dihybrid itself, the beginning 
part die is kind of a giveaway for two. So now we're assessing for two genes here. We're assessing for seed color and seed shape, where the letter Ys um, are for the seed color here, but you notice we have the opportunity of getting a yellow and a green seed color. And for our seed shape, we can get round and wrinkled. And right here for this um, um, homozygous recessive parent here, you could see how it's a little shriveled up. That's what it means by like wrinkled, but yeah. So um, starting off with our P generation, starting off with our true breeding parents, um, where we have completely homozygous dominant for one parent, this can be mom or dad and vice versa, whichever one you wanna, however you wanna go with, but think of these as two different individuals. And then um, you have the other parent that's homozygous recessive for these traits. So we have this one that is homozygous dominant. So they are completely yellow and round. And these are homozygous recessive that are completely green and wrinkled. And whenever you do, um, Across these guys, you get a hybrid F1 generation, just like in the mono hybrid. And um, you get this hybrid because you get these heterozygotes where they have, um, they pretty much have the allele. Like now, whenever their offspring pretty much represents that they are yellow, but carry the green allele. And they are round, but they also carry the wrinkled allele. So whenever these are allowed to self fertilize, you get what is here as the F2 generation. And these are pretty much the gametes that are produced here. And by gametes, remember, um, these are your sex cells and you get four different opportunities whenever these go in this little dihybrid cross, they're pretty much multiplying by each other here. So we can get our outcome. And real quick, sorry. Trying to get this thing out of the way. Zoom is not cooperating with me. One second. Cool. So the way we get these four different um, gametes um, here that we're pretty much going to use for our F2 generation um, is they essentially pretty much kind of cross multiply them where you multiply like this one and this one and then this one and this one. So whenever you do that, and what I mean by multiply in a way is that this is pretty much how you how they got their um, gametes that are, you're going to use to get that F2 generation. So when you get um, capital Y, capital R, you get YR, or I'll just point to it, I guess. But you get that YR right here. And then capital Y, little r, you get that one right here. Little Y, little r, you get that one right there. And then little y big r, you get that one right there. Um, so these are the four different gametes produced that you're going to use to pretty much do that F2 generation and you know fill out the square. And um, is everybody pretty much familiar with how um, they're filling out the square? They're pretty much kind of bringing um, each allele down and kind of multiplying them and pairing them up and everything. Is everybody pretty much familiar with that? Cool. So. Um, Notice how this one, we have a phenotype ratio here, which is nine to three to three to one. And the way we get that is by, um, I know it doesn't necessarily give out the um, alleles here, but this is yellow and round. Remember yellow and round should be denoted as capital letters. So we're gonna pretty much um, count for these nine um, um, out of 16 possible outcomes. And 16 because um, there are 16 outcomes here, whenever four by four is 16 total. So we're gonna count all of these guys. So we got YR right here. This is one of those. YR right here, another one of those. And notice I am counting this one as well um, because remember, even though we do have a recessive um, allele right here for Y, phenotypically because of the dominant allele, it's gonna express yellow. So we are gonna go ahead and count that one as well. Got another one here, capital Y, capital R, capital Y, capital R. Here, 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 and here. So whenever you count those, it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's where we get the nine. And what these guys are pretty much phenotypically expressing here is um, yellow, a yellow seed with a round shape. And then now we got our green seed with a round shape. So remember, green is recessive, so we should have if anything, double um, recessive Ys, because as if we have a, if we had a dominant capital letter, it would pretty much mask that. So we need to pretty much have 
double Ys and it should be round and we should have at least a capital R. Double, oh, I'm sorry, double lowercase Ys. So that being said, we have double lowercase with capital R right here, right here, and right here. So that's where we get the three from. And then lastly, we have yellow and wrinkled. So we should have capital Y with a lowercase r. And that's going to be these guys right here. Capital Y, lowercase r, here and here. That's where we get our other three from. And then lastly, our last um, possible outcome of you know physical expression is our green and wrinkled. And there should only be one. And when we cross all of them out, we are left with the only one right here. So this is how we get that nine to three to three to one. Um, phenotypic expression. And this is what we're going to go ahead and use whenever we do our chi-square analysis. As we move along, um, I want to say that's pretty much it as far as giving you a little bit of background in the monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. Um, the dihybrid cross is a little trickier, but um, you know, um, is there anything else, or not anything else, I'm sorry, but was there anything left unclear or can I go ahead and move on? Good. So that being said, um, like I said, we're going to want to focus on these ratios here because we're going to be performing a chi-square analysis um, on the assessment of whether, you know, um, following Mendelian genetics, do we get these phenotypic ratios? And let me go ahead and share a new screen here. Um, So hopefully you all are seeing this, but um, I switched it to the assignment that's pretty much that you all are gonna be working on. So we're, we're pretty much gonna be using um, is that statistical st test that I mentioned, that chi-squared goodness of fit test. And what we're pretty much doing is to pretty much compare um, actual observed data to any kind of model results. And um, let me go ahead and elaborate here. So the chi-square test, um, I'm not super sure if Excel can do this through the computer. Maybe you can, I'm not super sure. But doing it by hand is relatively pretty easy. And I'm going to go ahead and give you an example um, on how to do this. But this is pretty much the, um, the chi-square analysis formula here, um, where O is pretty much the observed data, the observed number of data points that you saw for a given trait versus the expected um, data points you saw for like a given trait. And then K here, um, it's not relatively necessary for the equation itself, but you're going to want to have K as a number of data classes here. Um, and I'll go further whenever we do the examples as what K is. And um, some things to take note is that for for these for the chi-square analysis that you're really going to want to have these like to pretty much get it like for the full assessment of chi-square analysis, you're going to need what is called a, a number of degrees of freedom where you subtract that K value that I'll go ahead and explain further, um, K value minus one. Um, you're gonna need to have like an H null and this what this is pretty much saying is a null hypothesis that is referred to as um, like what you expect to be true. In this case, our null hypothesis is that Mendelian inheritance is occurring and phenotypic ratios should express the way we know them to be. Um, as well as a P value, um, this will become important for the analysis of the chi-square test itself, as well as the chi-square value itself um, for whenever you do go into the assessment and um, plugging it in to see what your, um, whether you accept or reject this hypothesis of yours. But yeah, um, and but before we do this chi-square test, I just want to tell you what you guys are going to be doing in the sense of getting the data for this chi-square test. So we're going to be doing it on corn, um, assessing for any kind of deviations, whether um, this Mendelian genetics is or is not occurring in the normal ratios that we expect them to be. And you're going to be doing two different chi-square analysis, one for a monohybrid cross and another one for a dihybrid cross. And for the monohybrid cross, um, it gives you that breakdown here that I showed you earlier of you know doing the little um, whole genetics starting with our P generation, um, you know. Um, breeding those, getting our hybrids, and self-pollination gets us this outcome where we have that three to one phenotypic ratio. And what we're going to want to do here is, um, so since this is a monohybrid cross, remember for our monohybrids, it had that phenotypic ratio, three to one. What we're going to want to do is assess for the fact that, is that actually occurring? Three out of the four chances, um, are you getting the dominant trait phenotypically expressing? And what you're going to want to do here is pretty much um, count 
um, how many, there are other questions for this assignment, but to do the chi-square analysis, um, you're gonna wanna count about 40 kernels, like 40 individual little um, corn kernels. And you can do that by, you know, um, I guess, uh, through the photo here and you can use that little draw um, little thing to kind of mark which ones that you're counting and just count random 40 like 40 random ones and out of the 40 you're going to count how many are purple and how many are yellow because it looks like for this one this is a monohybrid class we're only dealing with one gene and we can see that um, because it's only denoted in one letter um, so that being said, and also whenever you do see their hybrids, you only see one trait kind of expressed. Their hybrids are all this dominant purple trait here. And right here, you end up getting two different traits. You either get purple or you get yellow. So um, what you're gonna wanna do is count 40 kernels. And then out of the 40, how many are yellow? Purple. And you're going to pretty much tally it up, and um, you know you um, this is going to be at random. You know, I guess um, I know everybody's going to have different counts of everything and um, whatnot. But um, assuming that you know Mendelian genetics is occurring, we should all kind of get the same kind of outcome that it is. But you know, depending on what you count, how you count it, it could be different. But the whole objective is here is that you're going to get this, and then so out of the forty, you're going to want to tally up how many yellow. And then how many purple, like I said. Ooh. And then for this, this is the numbers that you're going to use for the chi-square analysis that we're going to be um, going on moving forward. Um, so let's say I randomly counted myself or whatever, and I counted about 30 purple and 10 yellow, just to literally tally it up like that. And this is going to be used for the chi-square analysis um, in the future. But um, I will go on to an example in just a second, but I did want to show you the dihybrid cross as well. So remember for the dihybrid cross, di meaning two. So now we're dealing with two genes. So uh, remember, um, so always think that um, you want to assign one gene to one letter. So now we got two letters here. I know it does say SU here, um, but don't let that confuse you. You could just keep them as letter S or something. I don't know why I kind of wrote it that way, but we do have two different letters now. So now we have something for color. Um, in the previous example, R was denoting color, whether it was either purple or yellow. And then S here, so now they um, physically look different. So it looks like we're dealing with the kernel shape here. So wrinkled. So it looks like all this is completely wrinkled, denoted in a lowercase s. And then all these are smooth or round, um, denoted in a capital R. So crossbreed these to get your hybrids, just like the example we did before. And cell fertilization gets you this outcome here. So we get that nine to three to three to one ratio. But now what you're assessing for is now you're assessing for two different genes here, the gene for um, kernel color and kernel, um, kernel shape. So um, that nine um, to three to three to one ratio here is, um, is pretty much referring to as, um, um, so for the capital or the homozygous dominant of like having purple and smooth would be denoted as capital R, capital S. Anything purple wrinkled is capital R, lowercase s, because as we can see in our parent generation, s um, is for the seed kernel, lowercase s um, for the seed, and then it is wrinkled. So um, you're gonna wanna have um, count anything with a lowercase s throughout. And anything yellow smooth should be lowercase r, capital S, and anything completely yellow and completely wrinkled should be um, lowercase r and s. And the same thing goes for here, but remember now you're going to be counting um, 40 kernels again, um, count 40, count 40 kernels, and then the same thing goes out of how, out of the 40, how many are purple smooth, how many are purple wrinkled, how many are yellow smooth, and how many were yellow wrinkled. And you're going to pretty much want to tally it up again, um, tally it up like the way you did it last time. But remember, now you're assessing for two different um, phenotypic, like, or four different possible outcomes, you know, um, and you, and, but you're assessing for two different genes here. But you're going to want to count how many of these are there. So legitimately just kind of um, choose dot random ones and just tally it up and be like, okay, these three right here are purple round or purple smooth. 
This one right here is yellow wrinkled. This one right here is yellow smooth. This one seems purple wrinkled, but you just are literally kind of tallying up which one has which um, phenotypic expression. And for that count that you get, you are going to go ahead and use it into the chi-square analysis. Um, but so far, have I lost anybody? Um, are we good? Cool. I'm going to take that as okay. Come on. Cool. So that being said, that's going to be pretty much this part of the assignment. Keep in mind, there are other questions here. Um, ask you which is dominant and everything um, and whatnot, what kind of cross it is. Um, but that being said, let me go ahead into the chi-square analysis part. So remember our chi-square analysis or this chi-square test is pretty much going to tell us if the expectations that we are familiar with actually compare to what we observe. So this count that you're going to get, oh, isn't falling out of mind. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So we're going to go ahead and see an example on this chi-square analysis, but um, just so you know, or just um, remember that this chi-square analysis is pretty much going to assess whether what we expect is actually what is occurring. So that's what um, that's what you're going to be using for your observed data, those observed counts you get. That's what you're going to be using. Our expectations is something we're going to be calculating, and I'll show you how to do that. It's relatively super simple. Um, but this chi-square test is pretty much going to tell us, yes, Mendelian genetics or inheritance is occurring. The phenotypic um, ratios that we've seen or are known to be true are actually, you know, following that, you know, outcome that we observed. Um, but before we go on to that, um, like I mentioned, we do have that H null or our null hypothesis, um, which is what we expect to be true in this case, which is Mendelian inheritance. Um, and um, remember, a hypothesis is an educated guess or a statement on what you think is occurring. and Try definitely not to confuse it with what uh, prediction. Um, and this is only going to come up for whenever we do our, you know, um, writing and, you know, um, other further assignments that may ask you for a um, hypothesis. Um, you don't want to confuse it with what a prediction is, which arises from a hypothesis statement. And predictions are usually in the form of if then statements. So uh, just a little silly or random example is that um, if you predicted something, um, you would pretty much kind of state it in the fact that like, if my hypothesis is correct, then this will occur. And remember, a prediction is definitely different from a hypothesis, but this is just something to take note of. And yeah, so for let me just kind of highlight it. I know it's a little confusing here. Let me just kind of highlight here. So this is for this first example, or I guess, um, well, the um, since you're doing a chi-square analysis for a monohybrid and a, chi uh, a dihybrid, this is for the monohybrid. And I will go ahead and, you know, dive into it. So um, remember, our, our null hypothesis is that Mendelian genetics is occurring. And remember, again, in our null, um, I'm sorry, in our monohybrid, um, sorry, monohybrid cross, our phenotypic ratio was three to one. And this is what we're really going to, like, necessarily be focusing on. Um, but remember, um, it's three to one, but there are four total outcomes. And this is what we're going to be using for our um, expected values. Let me go ahead and put these first. Cool. So for ex so with this corn, remember we're um, for the monohybrid, sorry, yeah. We're assessing for, it looks like kernel color. So uh, we're going to count how many purple, how many yellow. And another thing to highlight is that um, based on following like this, you know, their little genetic makeup and everything and seeing their F1 hybrids, you can kind of tell that based on these hybrids here, you can um, pretty much tell that the purple color is the dominant trait here. Not only that, but it tells you right here, capital R, capital R, this is the dominant trait. So whenever um, making your counts, you're going to kind of want to hope slash assume that you're going to get more purple than yellow. Oh, there you go. So um, that being said, um, you're going to want to get more purple than yellow. Um, so that's where you, that uh, phenotypic ratio comes into play. Remember that phenotypic ratio is highlighting that three out of the four chances, you're going to, um, three out of the four chances of you getting offspring with a dominant trait. So that's what you're going to pretty much do to get for your expected counts for your purple. 
you're going to pretty much multiply three out of four uh, or like, you know, um, um, three quarters times 40, 40 being the number of kernels you're counting to get you an expected value of 30. And this is what you're going to put in to that for your expected values here in your chi-square. And then expected for yellow, uh, remember you get a one in four chance that you get a recessive um, yellow trait. So whenever you multiply um, a quarter or one fourth times 40, again, 40 being the number of kernels that you're required to count, um, this gets you a value of 10. So this is our expected for these values. So that being said, um, in my example here, I didn't count them. I'm just kind of throwing out these random numbers. So the observed values is what you guys are gonna count. So the observed that I got, let's say I did it, I got 28 purple and I observed 28 yellow, I'm sorry, 12 yellow. Um, now I can go ahead and plug this into my chi-square test because all we need to do is essentially do the sum of this whole kind of equation. So you're gonna be doing this pretty much multiple, multiple times is gonna be like this plus this. It's gonna pretty much kind of do it plus, that's what the sum means, you're gonna do it multiple times or you know, kind of add it together to get your um, answer. And what I kind of mean here, I know that kind of sounded a little silly, but what I mean here is by doing essentially this. So our chi-square test is essentially saying observed minus expected squared over expected. So this is where I'm gonna plug in that observed number. So for the purple, I observed 28, but what I calculated for my expected was 30. And I'm gonna square that, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and square this subtraction of these two values all over the expected value for the purple. And keep in mind that you're gonna to want to um, go ahead and separate them by you know their physical attributes, you know, try not to confuse, um, try not to put the wrong expected values where they shouldn't um, go. But yeah, so that's the, um, this first part of it, but remember we're dealing with two different um, physical expressions here, or, you know, um, physical outcomes. So for our um, yellow aspect, um, we got 12 because I observed 12 yellow, quote unquote, but I'm, this is just giving you an example. I didn't count them, but um, so I observed 12, but I expected 10 square this all over the expected value of 10. And once you math this out, um, it shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, by hand, but if you guys run into any issues, feel free to let me know. I'm not familiar if there's any kind of um, program or anything that can do this for you, but um, yeah. So whenever you do the math, you get this chi-square value, 0.53. Cool, so what does this mean? So um, we are gonna be plugging in into this chart uh, right here, but before we do that, what we're gonna be needing is a degrees of freedom value. So degrees of freedom, um, it's pretty much kind of, assessing for um, whenever you compare different things, you can have different number of classes uh, or different. So here we're assessing for two um, different kind of um, physical outcomes. Whenever we work with a di uh, dihybrid cross, we're gonna be working with four different possible outcomes. So it's pretty much, uh, degrees of freedom is pretty much kind of assessing for the fact that you can have different number of classes. So it's kind of assessing for that kind of, you know, um, I guess, for any kind of error that could occur. But um, degrees of freedom, this is a um, little formula for it. It's essentially K minus one, K being the number of classes and data classes. And in this case, we have two different, like I said, physical expressions or different outcomes. We can either get purple or yellow. So that's where you get the two from. And then it's gonna be essentially two minus one to get you this value that you really, really, or that you're gonna be moving forward with. This is what your degrees of freedom is for the monohybrid cross to right here. We're gonna to wanna to be focusing on this number. So that being said, okay, so now that we have our degrees of freedom, we're gonna go ahead and connect this chi-square value into that chart that um, I'm referring to a little bit below in this um, assignment here. So, sorry, what was it again? 0.53. So the way you're gonna to wanna to read this, this is like a little probability chart or something that statisticians have established. And um, the cool thing is I, um, I believe on your course contents, you're given like, you're given this exact thing in the form of a table. I find this way easier to read. Um, so I would say, go ahead and just kind of look at this one. Um, but the cool thing is about this one is that it has these, um, it has this separated in the, in the like significant regions here. 
So, and what I mean here is that, as you notice, whenever you get to this 0 0.05 region and anything below it, it remains red. What this is pretty much highlighting is that if you kind of fall into any region within here, this would mean that you're, um, this region is statistically significant, meaning that there's something out of the ordinary possibly going on with this specific thing you're testing. If you um, get an outcome that falls within this region, it means everything's as it should be. You fail to reject the null hypothesis. Everything is occurring as it should. But let me go ahead and actually plug in that value that we got. So we got 0.53. So um, it's a little bit in between this guy. So I'm going to be making pretty much like a guesstimate here. So and that's totally fine. So 0.53 is within this middle region here. So what you're going to want to do, along with your degrees of freedom, as you can see here, it has different degrees of freedom. Um, our degrees of freedom for this monohybrid chi-square analysis is one, as we just calculated. It was k minus one, two minus one. This is what we're pretty much gonna follow. As soon as we work our way up along um, the y-axis, we're gonna go ahead and wait until we kind of intersect with that first degree of freedom line. Here we go. Then we're gonna work our way left oh, along the x-axis and follow that line to give us our p-value which is 0.5 right here. Again, the way I read that is we got our chi-square value 0.53, kind of guessing that it's around this region right here, worked our way up until we intersected with this first degree of freedom line. We don't wanna go any further because obviously it would give us a wrong result, but our degree of freedom is one. And then work our way along the x-axis to get us that 0.5 p-value. <clears throat> So yeah, but that's what it was, right? Yeah, 0.5. So yeah, that being said, what does that mean now? So um, we're gonna go ahead and fail to reject this null hypothesis. And that's only because, um, like I said, um, so statisticians, like I said, use this 0 0.05 region as like a threshold of when it becomes out of the ordinary. So because our p-value ended up in this nice blue region here, um, it ended up, um, being not statistically significant. So this, that being said, Mendel's um, laws of inheritance are occurring as they should. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We are physically seeing that the outcome of what I observed, that three to one ratio is actually occurring. If you were to get anything in this region here, it would essentially mean that it's very significant. That means it's something funky could be occurring, whether it be other genetic or environmental factors or something that you're just not aware of. But if you got something in this region, that would pretty much indicate that you would wanna do some further analysis to kind of uncover what is going on. And I do have this here. Um, this is like a cool little breakdown of essentially like um, what these values mean again. Um, so anything, if you get a p-value that is less than that 0 0.05 threshold is statistically significant, as I said, and anything greater than, and um, is not statistically significant, where we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Right? Oh, sorry. Underline here. And then at our result here, what did we get a p-value of again? I'm sorry, it was 0.5, right? Yeah, it was 0.5. So, and that's especially proven here because our p-value is definitely 0 0.5, and it's definitely greater. Oops. Than 0 0.05. So this is also not like this is just kind of proving also an indicator that um, the outcome in this example that I did, uh, we're failing to reject the null, which means that we're like, um, nothing out of the ordinary is going on. So this is just pretty much what it does really. Um, if we got some something out of the ordinary here where I, I fell into this region, I would pretty much reject the null hypothesis and I would have to state that you know, Mendel's laws of inheritance um, are not occurring. It could be some other kind of, you know, biological process that's disrupting this. Um, but yeah, and that was for the, and this was a essentially a chi-square analysis for the um, monohybrid cross. Have I lost anybody or was that pretty straightforward? Good, cool. So, um, I will help you guys set up by doing an example for the dihybrid cross, but I didn't do the complete analysis of it. Um, but I will help you kind of set it up because now that we're assessing for two genes, remember we have four different outcomes. So we have a different degrees of freedom value. 
<clears throat> as well as a different phenotypic ratio to be assessing for or to be kind of observing for. So that being said, so expected mean of these up here. Cool. So this is gonna be for a dihybrid cross. I'm just gonna highlight this different color. This is a different example. No, hopefully this isn't too loud. Okay. Oh, part of this too. But um, so for a dihybrid um, chi-square, remember we have a different phenotypic ratio. It was at nine to three to three to one ratio that gave us essentially 16 total outcomes. And um, so for your corn kernels, we're gonna be these four different outcomes. You can either get purple smooth, purple wrinkled, yellow smooth, or yellow wrinkled. And with this ratio here, we're gonna be using this these set of numbers um, to pretty much count our expected. So for our expected ratio for a purple smooth outcome, um, given that it's, um, I guess the one that has the most possible outcomes at nine, this is where we're gonna get nine out of 16, 16 because there were 16 total outcomes. If you add these all together, it's 16. So to get the expected, um, you're gonna do nine out of 16 times 40 to get you about 23. And then, um, you know, um, kind of doing it along here. And I'm honestly kind of, um, rounding up if you guys do the math yourself you're going to notice that it's going to be about like 22.5 or something or like decimal numbers and obviously you can't get half of an individual so i'm just kind of rounding up and down wherever it kind of works but um it's fine if you wanted to leave them in decimal numbers it's fine it's but yeah um and you're going to do this and again 40 because this is how many kernels that you guys are required to count um and then, you know, this is, you see it's nine to three to three to one. Um, and this is where you get those expected values. So let's say I observe these values. Let's say I counted it myself. I counted all the purple smooth um, out of 40 and I got 26 of those, five of the purple wrinkled, six of the yellow smooth and three of the yellow wrinkled. So now we can go ahead and plug it into our chi-square test. So, oh, and then I guess um, I guess highlighting our degrees of freedom as well. So remember, we're dealing with four different phenotypic expressions in the end. We can get look, we have the opportunity to look like this, 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 or this. And those are four different outcomes. Those, so that's gonna be your K value, the number of data classes. So this is where your degrees of freedom changes. So now you're gonna have four possible um, data classes, and then you're gonna subtract that by one to get you your degrees of, free, um, degrees of freedom value of three. Remember, this is what you're going to plug in for that chi-squared um, analysis. <clears throat> but kind of setting it up, remember, so now that we're dealing with four different phenotypic outcomes, you this chi-square analysis does get longer because now you have to assess for four different expecteds and four different observed. So that's essentially what I did here. So just kind of going in order from, from top to bottom. Um, I observed 26, but I expected 23. Square this out of... Um, um, dividing all of this by my expected 23. Um, going on to that, I observed five of the purple wrinkled, but I expected eight, square this all over eight. For this one, um, I observed six yellow smooth, but I expected seven, <clears throat> square this all over seven. And then lastly, for the yellow wrinkled, I observed three, I expected two, and I'm just drawing these numbers from here from where I you know, calculated slash observed. And then all over two, because I expected two, and then I get that chi-squared value. Um, so I didn't get the analysis of this. Um, I'm not sure what the value is, but the way you're gonna wanna do that now um, is now you're gonna read the chart a little differently because now you're gonna wanna follow along this line here. So the first um, example, we stopped at this first line here because of this first degrees of freedom. So now, whatever calculated chi-square value you get, let's say, I, I'm not sure what the value is here, let's say I calculated two, I'm just throwing that out there, I didn't do it, but I'm just saying it. So if I got a calculated chi-square value about two, I'm gonna work my way up here and stop until I hit that third degree of freedom line right here, work my way up to get me my p-value. And I would use that as 0.6 but clearly this number is way bigger than this 0.5 threshold. So it would essentially mean non-statistically significant. But 
Yeah, and that's essentially what you want to do. Like I said, for this degrees of, I'm sorry, this dihybrid chi-square analysis, I didn't do the full analysis. I just kind of help you set it up. Um, because I definitely want to highlight, because now that you have two more different phenotypic expressions, you will need to assess for all four of them and then add them up to get you that value. But yeah, um, is that pretty straightforward? Did I lose anybody there with that last part? Cool. Um, I want to say probably one of the last topics to go over here. But yeah. Um, and let me know if you guys have any questions on how to read this or you know how to make the assessment. Um, this whole document gives you great background information as well. Um, as I don't think this is included on here, but the video will be posted, but this is like some good things to remember to help you kind of read the chart, like what exactly do my results mean. And ultimately what this test, like I said, is telling us is whether what we expected to happen in Mendelian genetics, whether it's with a monohybrid giving you a phenotypic ratio of three to one, is that normally occurring? Are we seeing more of the dominance over the recessives? Or in this case, like, um, you know, in that seed case, it was like, um, the, or the kernels, it was purple over yellow, um, and so on and so forth. But um, I believe this is pretty much it from your assignment. Let me, hold on, let me share, just kind of open the assignment with you just so I can see whether I forgot to cover anything. So here's y'all's assignment. So it's just following along that document, that Word document, it's copying a lot of these same questions. I'm wondering if it's going to ask you. Yeah, so um, if you guys have any questions on how to um, assess for it, just keep in mind it does um, ask you to kind of give you, like, to give an answer, like, so do you accept or reject the null hypothesis, or is it significant or anything? That question does come up and it will come up for both for the monohybrid and dihybrid. So, um, but like I said, um, I know Dr. Cook said that you all haven't covered it yet, 